GLC is now offering a free audio stream of our 24-7 broadcast that we're calling GLC Radio, an online radio station that broadcasts our round-the-clock audio stream on a variety of platforms. GLC Radio gives you the ability to listen to GLC virtually anywhere, through your home or office computer, or on the go with a mobile device. You can access GLC Radio through our website or by searching for God's Learning Channel through iTunes Internet Radio, TuneInRadio.com, or on Shoutcast.com. Explore various GLC Radio-enabled mobile apps by visiting our website at glc.us.com forward slash listen forward slash GLC Radio. GLC Radio, your free connection to GLC anywhere, anytime. Well, welcome to Update News. Dad's not here because he just didn't want to be here today. <laughs> just so went to sleep today. Anyway, we have interesting things going on here in the studio right now. Corey is running camera. He's our floor director. He's running sound. What else are you doing? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. But Vanita's here. She's running teleprompter and Ryan's in there and he's directing. Laughing at us. He is laughing at us. We've got some great news today. Uh, we hope lots you had a wonderful of, weekend. Of, yes, indeed. I had a wonderful Shabbat. You know what I spent my Shabbat doing? What? Checking out that new Bible. All right. Oh, I love that Bible. So don't forget to watch Light of the Southwest tonight. We're introducing the Messianic Jewish Family Bible to you tonight. Okay. And so the first hour, Donnie and I are talking about quite a few of the pictures that are there. Mm. You don't want to miss that program tonight. And tomorrow night, you will get to see the miracle story and how to strengthen your faith with um, Lonnie and Deidre Pugh. Mm -hmm. So two extremely excellent programs that I am hoping is what God intends to bring to the light of the Southwest set this year. Really mm -hmm, incredible mm -hmm. things right. that really inspire us and help us prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. We, that's been our goal all along, you know. To well, highlight. you know, the, the Jewish roots are really great. And I will tell you, I watched just one incredible video this weekend that um, I'm Copy. trying to get permission to air on here. We'll see if that, that works out. Mm -hmm. But um, it's from a Jewish perspective and talk about an eye opener for Christians. And I'm like, he's right on target and I've never heard any of this stuff. Huh. So awesome. anyway, you know, oh, and in the office, they are at this moment printing the 2014 year in tax receipt letters. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, I got to work on more Roundup packaging yesterday afternoon. Uh -huh. So when Becky gets back from her self-imposed vacation, she will be uh, taking them to the post office for us. Okay. <laughs> oh. um, well, uh, today, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick uh, made the following statement regarding Governor Greg Abbott's proclamation making February 2nd Chris Kyle Day. As you know, Chris Kyle uh, is the sniper that they made the movie of. Uh, as Lieutenant Governor, I proudly support Governor Abbott's decision declaring February 2nd officially Chris Kyle Day in Texas. I appreciate his efforts and recognize this American and Texas hero whose bravery, courage, and ultimate sacrifice reminds us all that our freedom has a price. We're thankful not only for Chief, Chief Petty Officer Kyle's service, but for the men and women that are protecting our freedom and our country every single day. So just so you know, today is was Chris Kyle Day in Texas. And I didn't even know that. See? See? This is why letter. we need GLC News. <laughs> I just needed it earlier than, you know. Uh -huh. Now, well, I have a really great letter since Dad's not here. I get to read the letter, and it is, I can't tell you who it's from yet. Dear ones at GLC, <laughs> I discovered GLC when staying in Farmington back in the 1990s when staying with brother and sister Holland there at the Mission. mission. These many years later... <laughs> GLC now is received in California through the internet. 
and the word from there is impacting the body of Christ worldwide. I'm enjoying the messages from the Jewish perspective. How refreshing to go deeper into the word of God with teachings from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Thank you for all your persistence. I can only imagine your struggles in keeping GLC on the air. In Yeshua's name, Shirley in Atascadero, California. Thank you, Shirley. It's a great letter. It is. Thank you for writing. And how exciting that you actually found it in Farmington, New Mexico. <laughs> where, well, we started in New Mexico. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we have a great love for New Mexico and a great love for Texas. Sure do. For the whole United States. We do actually have a great love for the United States. Yeah, we do. Uh, I found an article. was going to use this Friday, but Ted Pierce was our guest. And... Uh, so I asked him, can we hold this over for today? Because this is important. Uh, Brett Bart, Texas, confirmed on last Tuesday that an Islamic tribunal using Sharia law is indeed operating in Texas. But not to worry. An attorney for the tribunal assures us that participation is voluntary. And one of the Sharia judges, Dr. Tahir al-Badawi says it's devoted only to non-binding dispute resolution. Well, this is how it starts. This is how it started in the United Kingdom. When Sharia courts were instituted there, Muslim and non-Muslim officials alike all assured the British public and the world that they would be voluntary, restricted to matters involving non-criminal matters and subject to the British courts. Any areas in which British law and Sharia law conflicted would be referred not to the Sharia courts, but to the British courts. But that's not exactly how it worked out. The Telegraph reported in August 2011 that there are growing concerns that the Sharia courts, quote, are creating a parallel legal system and one that is developing completely unchecked, end quote. The Independent stated in April 2012, some Sharia law bodies have been misrepresented by the media as being transparent, voluntary, and operating in accordance with human rights and equality legislation. This is not the case. Many Sharia law bodies rule on a range of disputes from domestic violence to child residence, all of which should be dealt with by UK courts of law. Instead, they operate within a misogynist and patriarchal framework which is incompatible with UK legislation. And in July 2013, the BBC of all places announced a video exposed, a video expose of the Sharia courts when a BBC panorama documentary went undercover in one of the 85 Sharia courts operating as a parallel legal system in the UK, uncovering the extensive abuse of women, refusal to grant divorces, charging of the woman but not the man for di divorce proceedings, and even the taking away of the woman's children, and rulings contrary to British law. Now this is coming to Texas. Sharia judge El Badawi says, this about the Islamic divorces his tribunal would be dealing with. Quote, while participation in the tribunal is voluntary, a married couple cannot be considered divorced by the Islamic community unless it is granted by the tribunal. He readily owned up to how sexist the process is. He says, quote, the husband can request the divorce directly from the tribunal. The wife must go to an imam who will request the divorce for her. Even worse, the UK's Telegraph reported this about the Sharia courts in its August 2011 report. After being beaten repeatedly by her husband, who had also threatened to kill her, Jamelia turned to her local Sharia council in a desperate bid for a way out of her marriage. In an airless room in the bowels of the mosque, Jamelia is asked to explain why she wants a divorce. She replies that her husband spends most of his time with his second wife. Islamic law allows men to have up to four wives. 
but complains he is abusive whenever he returns to her home. Her request for a divorce was denied. For the sake of the children, you must keep up the facade of cordial relations, the Sharia judge told her. The worst thing that can happen to a child is to see the father and mother quarreling. The Telegraph article adds ominously, while a husband is not required to go through official channels to gain a divorce, being able to achieve this merely by uttering the word talaq, the word talaq, Islamic law requires that the wife must persuade the judges to grant her a dissolution. El Badawi sounds as if he is planning to set up the same system right here in Texas. Will the Texas Sharia court also turn a blind eye to spousal abuse, like the British Sharia court that heard Jamila's case in accordance with its uh, Quranic directive? Men are the managers of the affairs of women for uh, that Allah has preferred in bounty one of them over the other. And for that, they have expended of their property. Righteous women are therefore obedient, guarding the secret for Allah's guarding. And those you fear may be rebellious, admonish, banish them to their couches and beat them. That's from Quran 434. You think that couldn't happen in Texas? When asked what he would do when Islamic law conflicted with American law, El Badawi said, we follow Sharia law. The dehumanization and diminishment of women is universal in the Muslim world. Muslim women can't go against what their husbands and Sharia judges decide, no matter how many times the Sharia court insists they're voluntary. Above, above all, they cannot go against what Islam says. These Sharia courts are vicious, misogynistic, and brutal. The host countries have no clue what goes on in these tribunals. They should be banned in Western nations. Instead, they're coming to Texas and probably soon to your state as well. The war, um, that is not good news for it Texas. It is not good news. You know, not only is it not good news for Texas, it's really not good news for the United States. It's not. We know what's going on. We do know what's going on. And you know what? If we want to sit back and turn a blind eye right now, then we can have it rolling here. That's right. Absolutely. In a very, <coughs> excuse me, short amount of time. And we have another article that basically comes from the Washington Free Beacon. The State Department hosted a delegation of Muslim Brotherhood aligned leaders last week for a meeting about their ongoing efforts to oppose the current government of President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi of Egypt, who rose to power following the overthrow of Mohamed Morsi, an ally of the Brotherhood, in 2013. The delegation also includes, or included, Gamal Heshmat, a leading member of the Brotherhood, and Abdel Magod al-Dadari, a Brotherhood member who served as a parliamentarian from Luxor. One delegation member, Walid Sharabi, is a, general, a secretary general of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council and a spokesman for judges for Egypt, a group reported to have close ties to the Brotherhood. Sharabi, the Brotherhood-aligned judge, flashed the Islamist group's popular symbol in his picture at the State Department and wrote in a caption, now in the U.S. State Department, your steadfastness impresses everyone according to an independent translation of the Arabic. Another member of the delegation, Maha Azam, confirmed during an event hosted Tuesday by the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, the CSID, another group accused of having close ties to the Brotherhood, that the delegation had fruitful talks with the State Department. Azam also said that the department expressed openness to engagement, according to one person who attended the event. Traeger, a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, told the Washington Free Beacon that the State Department is interested in maintaining a dialogue with the Brotherhood due to its continued role in the Egyptian political scene. The State Department continues to speak with Muslim brothers 
on the assumption that Egyptian politics are unpredictable and the Brotherhood still has some support in Egypt, he said. But when Brotherhood delegations then post photos of themselves making pro-Brotherhood gestures in front of the State Department logo, it creates an embarrassment for the State Department. Well, after the recent speech al-Sisi made calling for a reevaluation of the aspects of Islamic thinking that are antagonizing the entire world, the State Department should be working closely with him on strategies for teaching against jihad violence and Islamic supremacism in Muslim countries. But instead, it's meeting with his opposition, which is dedicated in its own words, according to a captured internal document, to eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house. So, hmm. So we're cavorting with al-Sisi's enemies. Mm -hmm. And what's really funny is we're the ones who helped get the Muslim Brotherhood into power there in Egypt mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. They terrorize the people. Oh, you know, with Sharia law, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And the people threw them out. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what is up with that? I know. Well, this article comes from the Washington Post. On February the 12th, 2008, Hezbollah's international operations chief, Ahmad Mag Magnia, walked on a quiet nighttime street in Damascus, Syria, after dinner at a nearby restaurant. Not far away, a team of CIA spotters was tracking his movements. As Magnia approached a parked SUV, a bomb planted in a spare tire on the back of the vehicle exploded, sending a burst of shrapnel across a tight radius. He was killed instantly. The device was triggered remotely from Tel Aviv by agents of Mossad, the Israeli Foreign Intelligence Service, who were in communication with the operatives on the ground in Damascus. The way it was set up, the U.S. could object and call it off, but it could not execute, said a former U.S. intelligence official. The United States has never acknowledged participation in the killing of Munia, which Hezbollah blamed on Israel. The former official said the U.S. helped build the bomb and tested it repeatedly at a CIA facility in North Carolina to ensure the potential blast area was contained and would not result in collateral damage. The extraordinarily close cooperation between the U.S. and Israeli intelligence services suggested the importance of the target. A man who over the years had been implicated in some of Hezbollah's most spectacular terrorist attacks, including those against the U.S. Embassy in Beirut and the Israeli Embassy in Argentina. Until now, there has been little detail about the joint operation by the CIA and Mossad to kill him, how the car bombing was planned, or the exact U.S. role. With the exception of the 2011 killing of Osama bin Laden, the mission marked one of the most high-risk covert actions by the United States in recent years. U.S. involvement in the killing, which was confirmed by five former U.S. intelligence officers, also pushed American legal boundaries. Former U.S. officials, all of whom spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss the operation, asserted that Mugnia, although based in Syria, was directly connected to the arming and training of Shiite militias in Iraq that were targeting U.S. forces. There was little debate inside the Bush administration over the use of the car bomb instead of other means. The authority to kill Mugnia required a presidential funding findings by uh, President George W. Bush, the Attorney General, the Director of National Intelligence, the National Security Advisor, and the Office of Legal Counsel at the U Justice Department all signed off on the operation, one former intelligence official said. The former official said, what we had to show was he was a continuing threat to Americans, noting that Munia had a long history of targeting Americans dating back to his role in planning the 1983 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. So who was this senior Hezbollah figure? Ahmad Mugnia was on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list and was sought by authorities in 42 other countries as well. 
Here are some of the major attacks Mugnia was allegedly involved in. The suicide bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut in 1983, which killed 63 people, including eight CIA officers. After the embassy bombing, two truck bombs hit the barracks on U.S. and French bases, killing 241 U.S. servicemen. And in 1984, Mugnia was allegedly involved in the kidnapping, torture, and killing of the CIA's Lebanon station chief, William F. Buckley. Officials said Mugnia sent videotapes of brutal interrogation sessions, sessions to the CIA before Buckley was killed. In 1985, TWA Flight 847, en route from Athens to Rome, was hijacked by Hezbollah operatives. U.S. Navy diver Robert Shetham uh, was murdered, and dozens of other passengers were held hostage for about two weeks. In 1992, another suicide bombing, this time at the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The terrorist attack left four Israeli civilians and 25 Argentinians dead, and wounded more than 240. Two years later, in July 1994, the AMIA, Jewish community center in Buenos Aires was bombed. It was Argentina's deadliest bombing ever. 85 people died, hundreds were injured. Most of the victims were Jewish. Argentina is home to a Jewish community of 200,000, the largest in Latin America and sixth in the world outside Israel. The day after the AMIA attack, a suicide bombing on the uh, Panamanian commuter, commuter plane killed all 21 passengers, 12 of whom were Jews. Eight days after the AMIA attack, the Israeli embassy in London was car bombed. And 13 hours later, a similar car bomb exploded outside a Jewish community center in London. No one was killed, but 22 were injured and millions of pounds of damage was done. Five Palestinians were later arrested in London and two convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison in connection with the bombings. Mugnia was also believed to be involved in the attack at the Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia in 1996 that killed 19 U.S. Air Force pilots and staff when the truck bomb blew up. We had to include the pictures of those bombings. I imagine people remembered a lot of them when they saw the pictures. Well, they do if they're old enough yes. to remember yes. them. But, you know... Pretty devastating bombings. These, okay. these guys Absolutely. aren't uh, playing games. No. They are not playing games. But that's who our CIA cooperated with Mossad to take out the, mm -hmm. the, one of the ringleaders in, mm -hmm. in all of those things. Right. Well, this next article comes from Arut Sheva in what is believed to be the first case in Sweden linked to the conflict in Syria. Swedish prosecutors on Monday indicted a former Syrian rebel accused of severely beating a pro-regime fighter in 2012 after a video of the attack was posted on Facebook. The 28-year-old Syrian immigrant to Sweden who fought in the Syrian civil war is accused of violating international law, including the Geneva Conventions, which govern the treatment of prisoners of war and of aggravated assault. A video of the beating posted on the defendant's Facebook account has been cited as evidence against the former Free Syrian Army fighter who has lived in Sweden since 2013. According to the indictment, the, def the defendant participated in beating an unidentified person tied to the Syrian state's armed forces in the summer of 2012 in a manner that resembles torture. The victim, whose hands and feet were tied, had been injured before the assault, which included several blows with a whip and a truchem, or with similar weapons. He was a member of Free Syrian Army? Wow, I, I'm pretty sure we supported those guys. Mm -hmm. The former so. Syrian rebel said he had been forced to perform the acts. He has been detained since October and a trial date has not yet been disclosed. Prosecutors said they would seek his deportation and a ban on re-entry to Sweden. The man arrived in Sweden in September 2013, the same month that Stockholm announced it would grant automatic <sighs> residency to all Syrians fleeing the conflict, except those found guilty of war crimes. 
I wonder if we'll let him in over here. Oh, of course. Since he was one of the guys we were helping to train. Great. Yep. Well, this article comes from Root Sheva and AFP. A 93-year-old former Auschwitz death camp officer will go on trial in Germany in April, charged with at least 300,000 counts of accessory to murder, a court said Monday. The German defendant, Oskar Groening, will face charges over the 425,000 people believed to have been deported to the camp in occupied Poland between May and July 1944, at least 300,000 of whom were killed in the gas chambers. The regional court in the northern city of Lunenburg said the trial, expected to be one of the last of its kind, would start on April 21st. 55 co-plaintiffs, mainly survivors and victims' relatives, will be represented at the trial. Gronig, then a member of the Nazi Waffen-SS, was tasked with counting the banknotes gathered from prisoners' luggage and passing them on to the SS authorities in Berlin, prosecutors in the northern city of Hanover said when he was charged in September. For this reason, he was known as the bookkeeper of Auschwitz. The accused also helped remove the luggage of victims so it was not seen by new arrivals, thus covering up the traces of mass killing, according to the prosecutors. Prosecutors said the defendant was aware that the predominantly Jewish prisoners deemed unfit to work were murdered directly after their arrival in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Groning told uh, German Daily um, Bild in 20, 2005 that he regretted working at Auschwitz, saying he still heard the screams from the gas chamber decades later. I was ashamed for decades, and I'm still ashamed today, said Groning, who was employed from the age of 21 at the camp, which was lib liberated 70 years ago last week. Not of my acts, because I never killed anyone, but I offered my aid. I was a cog in the ma killing machine that eliminated millions of innocent people. The German office investigating Nazi war crimes sent files on 30 former Auschwitz personnel to state prosecutors in 2013 with a recommendation to bring charges against them. The renewed drive to bring to justice the last surviving perpetrators of the Holocaust follows a 2011 landmark court ruling. For more than 60 years, German courts had only prosecuted Nazi war criminals if evidence showed they had personally committed atrocities. But in 2011, a Munich court sentenced Don John Demjanjuk to five years in prison for complicity in the extermination of Jews at the Sobibor camp, where he had served as a guard, establishing that all former camp guards can be tried. About 1.1 million people, mostly European Jews, perished at Auschwitz Birkenau, operated by the Nazis from 1940 until it was liberated by Soviet forces on January the 27th, 1945. See, that's the thing. You can't even be a little cog in the wheel. You're guilty. Because if you're helping to perpetrate atrocities, if you are not standing up against the atrocities, you're a part of it. That's why we cannot be silent while That's right. these atrocities are going on all over the world today. But, you know, you can't look back and go, oh, I, well, many people do. I wish I would have done something. Think how many people live on the continent of Europe that go, I wish I would have done something mm -hmm. once they saw the pictures mm -hmm. of what was going on, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, so that's pretty much it for the news. I do want to remind you, to be sure and watch Light of the Southwest tonight <laughs> and tomorrow night. Yes. You're, you're really, really, really going to love them. Thanks for standing with us. All yours, Mama. We do love you and, and thank you so much. Thank you for praying for us and, and thank you for your letters and those checks. <laughs> God bless you.